Now, for people who haven't seen newscast on TV because it's visualised, we have a picture on our desk of Adam and Chris looking at us. Well, looking there. Well, it's pointing the other way. Well, it could be. It was. But it's there. Do you want me to move it so they are looking at you? No, that's relevant, isn't it? Well, I could do that. How do you feel? Oh, let's do that. So how do you feel now? I feel very fine. I love looking at you and Henry. OK, I'm going to do something. I'll have to move my microphone for this moment. Okay. Hang on. Laura is rising from her chair. I say rising, struggling. At... Now she's now put the picture in front of me and Chris and Adam. And how do you feel now? Well, obviously jealous and threatened by two <laughs> colleagues. <laughs> now, if you're listening to this, not watching, Paddy's knees are trembling. His eyes are doing something that I don't even know how to describe. So I'm going to move the picture back. OK, hang on. I'll move it. You, you, you tell us why we're doing this awful. OK, so one of the strange things... Well, one of the things that I think people watching at home might have remarked on from our interview with Keir Starmer this morning is he's cleared up the mystery about why he moved Margaret Thatcher's portrait from the wall in his study. But the way that he cleared up the mystery, he says he doesn't like people looking at him in portraits. This is not actually about Margaret Thatcher at all. I don't like images and pictures of people staring down at me. I've had it all my life. When I was a lawyer, I used to have sort of pictures of judges. Staring. I don't like it. Um, I like landscapes. So this is my study. It's my private place where I go to work work. Um, I didn't want a picture of anyone. It's a picture of landscapes. As a lawyer, people tried to persuade me that I needed pictures of judges staring at me the whole time. I didn't like it. I don't like it anymore if they're politicians. There isn't any politician staring at me. In the wow. I mean, I suppose if you are the Labour Prime Minister mm. and it's a picture of Margaret Thatcher staring down at you, you might be tempted to move it. Well, you might be. It's also it's an interesting little revealing land grab about being in number 10 because the Prime Minister's office is actually not that office. It's another little office somewhere else. Well, not a little office, quite a big office in the building and what was called the Thatcher Room is another whole study. So it sounds like Keir Starmer's bagged himself an extra room to go and do his afternoon reading. Well, it's a lovely bit of revelation from your latest scoop, which we will dissect with Henry on this episode of Newscast. Newscast. Newscast from the BBC. Hello, it's Paddy in the studio. And Laura in the studio. And Henry at home. Hello, Henry. How nice to be reunited with you as well as Paddy. What did you make of the interview with Sir Keir Starmer the, in the cabinet room? And mm. the first big, the first big one, I think, Henry, isn't it? Yeah, I think certainly his first sort of broadcast interview uh, that properly looks forward to all the many challenges to come over the next few months and years of his premiership. And you know, I think that was the background which framed the interview and really framed his mood. It's not cheery, is it? It's not, mm. hurrah, there's the first Labour Prime Minister for 14 years and sunlit uplands are just around the corner. Um, you know, it's, 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 I hesitate to say gloomy because, um, you know, this government is very deliberately trying to tell people that the tough decisions are a necessary way of getting to a better place. But nevertheless, there is a big emphasis on the tough decisions that are going to come first. Um, and this interview comes just as we head into a week where, Keir Starmer's first tough decision, to use his lingo, which was the means testing of the winter fuel payment, is going to harden, I think, into probably his toughest parliamentary moment yet, which is when MPs are given the chance to vote on it. Um, and I think it all shows that he won an outstanding parliamentary victory, but that doesn't mean that the next four or five years are going to be plain sailing for him. Far from it, there's all sorts of tricky decisions that are hurtling his way and that you could sort of see in the interview, you know, he is having to grapple very hard about how to deal with them. And it's interesting to me, Henry, that he also didn't just say, oh, it's going to be painful, oh, there are tough times ahead. He also said, I think we have to be unpopular, which is a sort of different thing. It's one thing telling the country, you know, buckle up, bed in, this is going to be hard. Also shouting and acknowledging very publicly that he expects his government not to be very liked by the public is, shall we say, quite an unusual thing for a politician to say. Normally they're like, like me, like me, please, please, like me. And he said, we have to be unpopular. But in a way, I think that was notable language. But I had to say also for me, there were quite a lot of echoes of other governments who've moved in and said, we're going to do the difficult things that other people have ignored for ages. Then when they try, they go, oh, actually, that's quite hard. We didn't mean it after all. Now, with a huge majority... Obviously, he has the a, a lot of space to do a lot of things and probably a long time, you know, four, maybe five years till the next election. So, but it's interesting how he's trying to cast himself as Mr. Unpopular, right? Mm, shall we have a little listen? 
Tough decisions are tough decisions. Uh, popular decisions aren't tough, they're easy. Uh, when we talk about tough decisions, I'm talking about tough decisions. The things that last government ran away from, that governments traditionally run away from, I'm convinced that because they've run away from difficult decisions, we haven't got the change we need for the country. Um, and because I'm so determined to bring about that change, I'll do the tough things and I'll do them early to make sure that we can bring about the change that we need. So I'm not going to apologise um, for this, but I do recognise how difficult it is for some people. I do recognise um, for pensioners it's really hard for some pensioners here, but of course they do rely on the NHS, they do rely on public transport, so these things aren't completely divorced. And with the triple lock, what I can guarantee for the state pension is that the increase under this government will outstrip um, any reduction in the winter fuel payment. And you put a figure on it, I've seen a figure of about £400 of a rise in the state pension and um, the, the maximum fuel payment is a 300 I think. So um, I think there's another thing both of you might uh, be able to help me out with. He's also got to do popular things because, I mean, this it is a democracy and I, I get the message, but you've also got to have something available on October the 30th, which puts a smile on my face, don't you think? I think that's absolutely right. And I think in a funny way, although this interview was pretty doomy, it was slightly less dooby than some of the statements we've had in the last few weeks. So he did then get to his sort of analogy that we have to fix the foundations because then you'll one day you'll have a beautiful house. You know, there will be the change in the longer term. But I think, you know, there are whispers around people saying, actually, the government's got to give people a few more reasons to be cheerful alongside the tough, 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 tough. But inside number 10, I think the view is it's better at this stage to oversteer on the gloom than to give people false hope. You know, I don't know, Henry, what you think of this, but my sense of talking to people around Starmer has been actually for some time is like the ultimate crime they see for a politician to commit is to say something that they then don't hold good to. And totally. that is, yeah. That, that, I mean, that is something that is very much guiding their thinking in number 10 and number 11. Mm. But one other thing that they are consciously trying to ape is what David Cameron and George Osborne did in 2010, which was get into office and ruthlessly and repeatedly blame their predecessors for everything being worse than they thought. And um, someone very senior in Downing Street said to me about a year ago, mm. um, David Cameron won the 2015 general election in the first few months after he took office in 2010. Not that Ed Miliband and his team realised it then. Ed Miliband wasn't even leader of the Labour Party then. <laughs> and that is kind of the way they are thinking about how to combat this leaderless Conservative Party. But I think there's a couple of issues that have reared their head for how Downing Street plans to approach this. I think one is the sequencing. People I speak to, including senior people in government, are sympathetic to the decision on winter fuel but they are confused about why Rachel Reeves decided to announce it before the summer, before the budget, mm -hmm. at the same time as she announced the public sector above inflation pay rises, which allowed Rishi Sunak, and I'm sure his successor as Conservative leader will do the same, at PMQs this week to say that this new Prime Minister had chosen mm -hmm. public sector workers over pensioners, over struggling pensioners. That is a political fault line which I don't think they wanted. And when you see the winter fuel cut, in the round in the budget with all sorts of other tax measures and spending measures, it might be an easier argument for the government to combat. Mm -hmm. But, you know, by doing a bit early, I think in a sort of zeal to demonstrate tough decisions, a lot of people think they've got them, they've got the sequencing wrong and made it harder for themselves. Right. Other uh, thing is that it's one thing for the government to decide they have a particular strategy, but there are hundreds of novice MPs, mm -hmm. in many cases on wafer thin majorities, who didn't actually expect to be MPs who are looking at this, looking at their email inbox, they might have 300 angry emails and that might be double the size of their majority and they're panicking. I went back in the archive to find Winston Churchill when he took back over in 1951, said, I don't think we have faced these serious circumstances since the war. So this business of saying it, the, it's been awful is very well trodden. It is. And, um, but you had a whole half an hour interview mm. and 
Uh, these, there's the there's the whipping mm-hmm. operation. There's the, what will happen to these MPs who might show they don't like the decision. What's going to happen to them? Well, people, newscasters, because they're a smart bunch, will remember that a few MPs on the left have already been sort of sent to the very much naughty benches for not voting <laughs> for, with the government on the King's speech. So there is very clearly a signal from Keir Starmer's Labour Party that if you are an MP, you are expected to keep in line or else there might be consequences. Now, he was coy about it today. He did that classic, oh, what it'll be for the chief whip. But he went on quite quickly to say we were all elected on a mandate to do hard things. So there are MPs who will have that very much in their mind when they're thinking about do they dare to vote against or do they end up abstaining. I suspect, as with most of these things in the end, there's a lot of hullabaloo and then the numbers at the end are actually often a little bit on the whelming of under on the other side. But look, we'll see, right? But, we'll see. But I do think that there is a question here in the longer term, as Henry has been hinting at, is Keir Starmer's operation going to be good at handling the parliamentary party? They've got a huge majority, so it doesn't necessarily matter very much day to day at the beginning, but there will come a time when handling the party in parliament becomes very, very important. But, you know, Tuesday's an early test of it, and I think Henry's right about the chronology of all of this. There's a kind of scratching of head of why have you picked this massive fight right now, and is it actually too clever by half? Should you have waited a bit to have done it in the budget but there was so much else that we talked about as well so we're going to we talked quite a lot about um winter fuel yesterday didn't we and i think some of the most interesting things to me from him today if i just rattle through a few of them one he almost gave away a little bit of something that british prime ministers aren't meant to do when i said are you excited or relieved that kamala harris is now the democratic nominee because he's going to the white house next week and he said something like well it's good to see the race shaping up as it is although of course i'll work with anyone but there was just a little kind of flicker which hinted at, oh, yes, thank goodness, actually, that the Democrats now have a different candidate, which, of course, I'm sure that Downing Street would not accept. That's what he was saying. But that just did stand out to me. I was also, when it comes to this issue of accountability, really interested on what he said about Grenfell. So remember, newscasters, during the election, Labour told us, till we were blue in the face, red in the face, if you're being uh, completely impartial about it, um, that they were ready for government. They knew exactly what they wanted to do. All their plans were prepared. After the Grenfell report this week, can they tell people watching or listening who live in unsafe houses when their houses will be made safe? No, they cannot. Now, you can talk about remediation and acceleration and all the difficulties and all the rest. But the fact of the matter is the government that sold themselves to us as being incredibly well prepared can't tell you if you live in an unsafe house by when you'll be safe. I want to get this done as quickly as possible. Each block will be on a different timetable. I'm not able to give you an end date, but I can tell you I meant what I said when I responded to the report. I said this has to be a turning point. It does, and we need to speed that up and get on with it as quickly as possible. Forgive me, Prime Minister, during the election campaign, you made great play of how ready you were, how much preparation you had done, how much you were going to walk in this building and get things done. And then today, you can't give us a date, a deadline, which is what people want to know. When will they be able to sleep easy in their beds? It is years since the Grenfell fire. It is years that you had in opposition. Everybody knew this was coming. You cannot be surprised by what this report has come out with. And this is about people who are, as of this moment, not safe in their own homes. Let me acknowledge that this has taken far too long. Seven years. This is not unique. We've had no end of injustices that have taken very many years uh, to come to any sort of outcome. And this is not the final outcome. But you're in charge now. Why can't you give people a date? And what comes with being in charge is responsibility. The responsibility to make sure this happens as soon as possible. Yes, it's welcome to government time, isn't it? Mm. Because one of the other things that happened was many MPs, Henry makes the point about novice MPs, Mm -hmm. many MPs cleared the chamber after Prime Minister's questions on Wednesday, just ahead of the statement about Grenfell, then found themselves directly criticised by the survivors and the families of the victims. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's chilling if you Mm -hmm. are an elected politician. One of the big performers in the government is uh, is Wes Streeting. He Mm -hmm. was on Radio 4 with me. The health secretary. He apologised for the uh, people who felt bad about the winter fuel decision. He said, I'm sorry about that, it's hard. Um, But then I also asked him in his new NHS review, which is due on Thursday, um, whether or not he would go private himself to beat the queues. And he said, yes, he would. He didn't have to, but he would. And he said he's going to use the private healthcare system in the UK to help the pressures on the NHS. 
Um, well, in terms of cancer treatment, I doubt I'd have been able to afford to go private. No, but diagnostics in, pr in, in principle. May, in principle. But, di but diagnostics, maybe. Yeah, look, lots of people are voting with their feet if they can afford it, and that's the two-tier system I'm determined to take on, and it's why I've taken on some of my critics on the left who are angry at the idea that I might use private sector capacity to bring down waiting lists faster. But I ask people to look at the state of our country today, where, where more people are paying to go private voting with their feet and with their wallets because the NHS isn't there for them when they need it and the pessimism we saw on the front page of the Observer last Sunday where a majority of Brits now assume that they will have to pay uh, for, for private health care. That's not the situation that I want to see. We will use the private sector to bring down NHS waiting lists faster on NHS terms so that no one has to worry about the bill um, at the same time as we rebuild capacity in the NHS to make sure the NHS is there for all of us when we need it, where we need it. It will be interesting this week when the Darcy report is published in full to hear exactly what West Streeting and Keir Starmer mean when they say, ah, well, the answer has to be reform. So West Streeting is there saying, oh, he's willing to use the private sector. But what do they actually mean in terms of reorganising the NHS or fundamental changes? Because that way often lies difficulty, complexity and things that don't quite turn out. So we'll, we'll see what they... We know they're not going to chuck absolutely gazillions of extra money in because they're always telling us there's not much money around. But actually, what are their plans for reform? Um, and we'll, you know, we'll see. I think that might be a fault line in the months ahead. Henry, do you think that there will be a surprise in the budget about health? Uh, very possibly. I mean, one of the interesting things in the Sunday papers today, actually, is a story in the Sunday Times about Alan Milburn, one of West Streeting's Labour predecessors as health secretary, hanging around the Department for Health and Social Care in meetings with West Streeting. Now, the Sunday Times make the interesting point. It doesn't actually, as far as we're aware, have a job working with West Streeting and, and it, people are raising concerns following some of the other stories about people getting jobs that perhaps shouldn't should have been different status jobs uh, in government as advisors to this new government. Um, but I just think also worth remembering, Alan Milburn was perhaps the Labour health secretary in the new Labour years who did the most mm. of the new Labour health secretaries to uh, bring the private sector in and use the private sector as he would see it for the benefit of the NHS. And so, you know, if we're treating, as he clearly is, is listening closely to him, then that clearly yeah. displays a particular direction. I saw him rushing down Whitehall this week, Alan Milburn, looking very tanned and very busy on a mobile phone. And some, some reporter somewhere might possibly have written in, in, in July that he was expected to be given something. Well, because like I, I, I read something... I don't know who that was. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, that was about chair of the NHS, wasn't it? Which, no, yeah. no. It, it was, was that he was going to be have some kind oh, of role. Oh, sorry. But he's sorry, didn't know what it was going to be. No, no, no. I'm it was a long time ago. <laughs> no, no. This is, this, is the, this is the meat and potatoes of a mm. podcast. It's, it's, mm. it's, and I've got a bit of... Uh, flag flying to do as well. I read a report in the week that what Labour might do is seek to have production line waiting list operation, mm. waiting list operations. In other words, get just reduce the waiting list in key areas of the country by doing constant uh, operations Alexis, on hips, so hips legs, and knees, yeah. cataracts. And, and that's and, what they did under Alan Milburn and it got the list down. And But you see that would be, because that's one of Rishi Sunak's failed tests himself. He said, we've not gone far enough. If within six months of being in government, they cut a significant waiting list by using any method, that will be a win. It goes back to what I said earlier. You can't just tell us how awful everything is. You've got to act. You've got to do something. And this is coming down to the first steps. So remember the first steps, the six first steps. So by January and February... I don't remember. remember <laughs> well, it was a bit... It was the, the six it, first steps the, to the five missions. Is this... Yeah, is this, is this, yeah. West Street could cool. remember do them have, all on the do programme. I, do, do you remember? Do I, do I have to give up alcohol? Is that, is that where it's going? <laughs> no, Paddy, don't. <laughs> worry about that that's it. like your eyes started garden. to flicker again um but that's that it was one of the you know there's an extra i think it's 42,000 appointments in the first year or something like whatever the specifics and i'm going to do a west treating when he was on the show he forgot the sixth of the six steps and i don't think he's forgiven us for doing that but the clip is still available on social media should anybody want to have a look but he remembered it the next time he came on but that you're right it's about then showing people that something good has happened that people voted for. But something good does still happen in the NHS. And I want to read out an email from Anne in Sleaford in Lincolnshire. And we are delighted to hear this news. But also it is important, I think, to make this point, as she does. Dear Laura and Paddy, yes, the NHS is underfunded and understaffed and there are a lot of other problems, particularly with children's care, as Laura described today. That was the story we mentioned about we mentioned yesterday. 
Here's a different story. And this is Anne's story, which she shared with us. On Friday, the 26th of July, I found a lump in my breast and the same day my GP referred me on. I was seen at the clinic two weeks later. After a biopsy and tests, I was diagnosed with early stage breast cancer. And we're very sorry to hear that and send you every good wish. But here's the good bit of the story. I'm having surgery next Friday to remove it. This is exactly seven weeks after I found the lump. I've been overwhelmed by the kindness and efficiency of the staff, which is the combination that everyone wants. This won't be the end of my treatment, but you can understand why I want to tell you about my experience. I'm a big fan of the podcast. Well, Anne, we are sorry to hear about that anxiety and your illness, but delighted to hear that you are happy with the treatment and how you have how you've been dealt with by the NHS. So thank you so much for getting in touch and we wish you all the best. Newscast from the BBC. So, as you say, Paddy, there are two new Downing Street cats. Jojo Starmer, actually, I don't know if that's Jojo's surname, if a cat has a surname. Uh, And I can be sure that we're going to offend someone in this. We really are digging. Do you remember when I said a cat was stupid? (laughs) Wouldn't know its name early on. It was bad when I had to come and pick you up from where you were taken off to. Um, So Jojo Starmer is apparently catching lots of the mice that are still in the Downing Street flat. So that's a little bit of snippet of feline gossip. The other thing is the name of the new Siberian kitten. Now, Henry, you saw the interview, so no cheating. Paddy, what do you think the name is of the new cat? I would say Whiskers. Nope. Um, Pussy Pookins. Nope. Um, Nibbles. (laughs) Nope. Tibbles. Nope. Uh, is this going to be a podcast all of its own? Because it's really good. Possible. Name, <laughs> Petcast. Guess, guess the names of cats when you don't know their names. OK. Now, I thought when I heard this, this is a dog's name. They've called it Prince. Oh, that is a dog's name. Well, you heard it there from Mr O'Connell. and He's an expert in these such things. Anyway, I thought that sounded a bit like a dog's name and you've clarified that it definitely is a dog's name. But the white Siberian kitten with the blue eyes has been called Prince. Lovely. So we've got Prince, Larry and Jojo. Yes. And Ooh. then there's Gladstone and... Oh, what are the other ones? There's Gladstone. There's, there's like uh, Treasury and Foreign Office. All I think there's one that doesn't have a public profile knocking about the cabinet <laughs> office called Ozzy. Osborne. Think. Oh, is it called uh, after Osborne? Oh, well, Gosh, maybe. that was a crawler who called it after a former Chancellor, wasn't it? Goodness me. Yes, Chad. So here's the new cat. Let's call it but, after but the, you. The great <laughs> secret about Larry is that he doesn't catch any mice. Yeah, he so just poses for the sort of camera. Very famous, but he he really does just swan about Downing Street, and I don't think I don't think Jojo and certainly Prince have met Larry yet. No. Uh, yes, so Jojo's apparently the cat, yes. proof, the, the cat flap in the bomb-proof door. That's right. So Jojo's apparent, door cats, Jojo's spending time in the family flat, going out ca- uh, catching mice, but not. Larry's like got the you know the official bits so are still Larry's domain. In fact, he was there yesterday, sitting in the hall. I just sitting. Uh, who are you? Why are you here? I just heard the phrase cat flap in the bomb-proof door. Is that what I heard? <laughs> yes. Did yes. I hear that? It's been a news yeah. story. Cat flap in the bomb-proof door and the names of the, all the cats in Downing Street means that the podcast is at an end. Thank God for that. No, it's been <laughs> interesting to the very last moment, I would say. So <laughs> I'm going to be the first to say farewell. We're back. We're reunited. <laughs> and that's lovely. It's a very good start. Newscasters do tell us how to improve. Brickbats and bouquets. But <laughs> goodbye. 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 <laughs> Newscast. Newscast from the BBC. BBC.